The whole ship trembled, and the vibrations caused a deep resonance in his body. Another explosion followed, and then a third. The engineers shouted out to each other. What had happened at that moment? Soryu's turbines went dead so abruptly that the men simply stared at the engines uncomprehendingly. It was as if the ship had been stabbed through the heart. From further forward, someone yelled, The boiler room was hit, another asked, Was it a torpedo? It was not an unreasonable question, given the ferocious nature of the initial explosions. In fact, the deep penetrating second bomb had ruptured the steam pipes in the boiler spaces, scolding nearly all the crewmen there to death. On the top side, a huge cloud of white smoke was jetting from Soryu's midships. Glancing down at his watch, Naganuma noticed it was 10.30am right on the dot. He looked grimly around at his comrades. What would happen to them now? Topside, the light in Commander Kanao's eyes slowly abated. He saw the entire flight deck from the island on back enveloped in a sheet of smoke. The fighters on deck were in pieces and burning. The explosions had also killed many sailors, including deck handlers and gun crews. Their bodies were strewn about in little white and tan piles. Canal stood there, petrified, and wondered if he was the sole survivor in the sea of fire now engulfing Soryu. If the difference between victory and defeat was narrow at Midway, then nowhere was fate more poised on a razor's edge than the attack on Akagi. Unlike Soryu and Kaga, which were both assaulted by a dozen or more bombers, Akagi was attacked by a grand total of three, and then only because of the quick thinking of Lieutenant Richard Best. Best had been about to dive Kaga with his entire squadron, but at the exact moment of pushover, he had witnessed McCluskey's squadron heading in as well. Best managed to pull out of his dive, but almost the entirety of his squadron went with McCluskey, and Best, with Lieutenant Edwin J. Kroger and Ensign Frederick T. Weber hanging off either wing, had maintained altitude and watched the outcome of the attack. Seeing that Karga had obviously been smashed, Best decided to attack the other large carrier near at hand with his element. Such a meagre force hardly constituted the sort of attack that would normally have been deemed necessary to destroy the flagship of Kaido Butai. But Best was determined to attack with what he had. Best's group didn't have time to do things by the book. Forming up for a sequential attack was standard doctrine, but instead Best's element attacked in the V formation they were already in. He headed north briefly, then reefed his men into a right-hand turn to dive on the target. The Best was in the centre, his wingmen perhaps 75 to 100 feet on either side. The Japanese also noted that the Americans didn't appear to dive as steeply as Kaga's assailants had. It may well be that Best had lost some altitude during his abortive dive on that ship. As they swooped down, approaching Akagi from her port side, Best aimed for what he thought was Akagi's island, but was actually her large, protruding stack on the starboard side, one of his wingmen aimed at the aircraft spotted on deck. The other chose the large red Hinamaru painted on Akagi's flight deck near the bow. Best's men must have held their formation all the way down, for their bombs landed in the same rough V formation. Incredible as it may seem, having just observed the attack on Kaga, Akagi was seemingly caught nearly unprepared by Best's sudden onset. It may be that Nagumo and his staff had judged that they were in the clear, at least for the moment, Kaga's assailants were attacking roughly east to west and away from them. But Torpedo Squadron 3's attack was still developing to the northeast, and Akagi didn't want to get entangled with them either. Thus, no one on board the flagship appears to have noticed Best, until his trio was nearly atop Akagi. On the flight deck, Petty Officer First Class Kimura had just been given the launch signal, and his Zero was heading down the deck and into the air. Suddenly, shouts rang out enemy dive bombers overhead. On the island, Commander Fuchida threw himself behind a bulkhead, covered with a protective cloth mantelet. Like both Kaga and Soryu, Akagi's fate was in her own hands, as far as anti-aircraft fire was concerned. The only weapons that could be brought to bear in her defence were her own, and perhaps the tiny automatic battery of her plane guard destroyer, Nowaki. Akagi's 25mm guns began spitting out tracers at the three attackers. There was precious little opportunity to bring the portside trio of 4.7-inch mounts into action, there was no time to generate a good fire control solution, 
Like all Japanese captains, Aoki relied on the helm to save his ship. As Captain Okada had recently discovered, though, evading 30-knot torpedoes was one thing. Avoiding 250-knot dive bombers piloted by professionals was quite another. Aoki put his ship into a maximum starboard turn, presenting his beam to the Americans the most favourable attitude he could achieve under the circumstances. Akagi described a huge right-hand circle, heading first north and then back around to the east. Nagumo's flagship very nearly escaped, and by all rights should have gotten away scot-free. If the element of surprise had been slightly less complete, her anti-aircraft fire, or that of Nawaki a little more effective, her manoeuvres a little more violent, or the aim of her attackers a little less precise. Akagi might well have dodged the trio of bombs aimed at her, with incalculable consequences for the outcome of the battle. Had she emerged unscathed from this attack, her air group would have been added to Hiryu's forthcoming strike, with potentially dire results for the Americans. Yet against all odds, Akagi received her mortal wound. Most accounts credit the Americans with two hits and a near miss on the flagship, but on closer examination this tally must be revised downward to a single direct hit. Almost all sources agree that the first of the three bombs slammed into the water about five to ten metres to port and forward of the island, which on Akagi was on the port side of the vessel. The resulting geyser towered high over the bridge, itself some eighty feet above the waterline, carrying away the radio antennae atop the island and drenching everyone on the bridge with a flood of dirty seawater. Within the surreal forms of the deluge, Commander Sasabe thought he saw the apparition of his mother's face. The third bomb is widely credited with hitting the aft portion of the flight deck, but in fact, it did not quite do so. Civilian newsreel cameraman Makishima, who was on Akagi's flight deck filming the attack on Kaga and the flagship, states explicitly that, while personnel located on her bridge might have deemed it a hit, in fact, the bomb almost grazed the edge of the flight deck and plunged into the water alongside the stern. The resulting geyser bent the edge of the flight deck upward, thus creating the illusion of a hit. Numerous secondary sources describe huge fires breaking out as a result of the aft, hit, but this actually was very unlikely for several reasons. First, there were no planes current hitting this area. Akagi had only combat air patrol fighters on her deck at the time of the attack. While Dick Best noted during his dive that Akagi's zeros were taking off from fairly far aft, they still would not have been spotted anywhere near the aft edge of the flight deck where the bomb came down. This is because the portion of Akagi's flight deck in the vicinity of the hit was literally rounded down to make landing easier and wasn't used for spotting because of its relatively steep incline. Even if a bomb had hit the flight deck in this area, it had absolutely no chance of carrying into the hangar deck and starting a fire there either. Because in this portion of the ship there wasn't any hangar deck. The rearmost 125 feet of Akagi's flight deck from the aft edge of the rear elevator all the way to the stern, was held up by four enormous steel supports. Underneath the wooden flight deck itself, there was nothing but steel girders, an overhead crane and airspace. Even if a bomb hit the flight deck squarely here, the deck would have initiated its fuse, and the bomb would have detonated in mid-air above the boat deck and fantail. None of the primary Japanese sources mention any such thing, Furthermore, a bomb could not have been carried down through the 60-odd feet of airspace, through the boat deck, and then through Akagi's main armoured deck, to detonate in her engine and steering spaces, the fuse would have exploded the bomb long before. Indeed, the general-purpose high-explosive bombs used by the Americans in the attack, with their relatively light cases, would not have penetrated Akagi's armoured deck under any circumstances. In a nutshell, then, with no planes on the flight deck in the area and no hangar deck below, there could not have been any fires of significance as a result of this hit. The Nagumo report directly supports this view, describing the damage aft as not being fatal and further elaborates damage. Several holes to after deck, one emergency personnel killed. This is hardly the sort of description one associates with the veritable holocaust on the flight deck often attributed to the hit aft. Nor does it match the very heavy and well-documented casualties suffered on Soryu and Kaga's hangar decks as the result of such blows. Thus, the first and third bombs were misses, 
With the third landing very close aboard indeed, it was the second bomb, landing at the aft edge of the middle elevator, which doomed Akagi. This weapon was almost unquestionably aimed by Best himself. He was a noted dive bomber pilot and had a reputation for both boldness and consummate skill. In the words of his backseater, aviation chief radio man James F. Murray, nobody pushed his dive steeper or held it longer than Dick. Given the V formation Best's element dived in, it is almost inconceivable that the trajectories of the bombs could have crossed in mid-air. Furthermore, from what we know about how the bombs landed in relation to the ship and each other, that is, in a rough V pattern themselves, it is likewise almost a certainty that the center plane in the V dropped the bomb that hit dead center on Akagi. That plane was piloted by Lieutenant Best. His 1,000 pounds payload sliced through the flight deck and exploded in the upper hangar in the midst of the Kanko parked there. To Commander Sasabe, Akagi's navigator, the hit felt deceptively gentle. Fuchida, who was also near the bridge, remembered the bomb landing with a crash and a blinding flash. A blast of warm air washed over him, yet the explosion was apparently also powerful enough to hurl aircraft over the side of the flight deck. Finally, just after 10.35 a.m., Torpedo Squadron 3's torpedo aircraft reached a position where they could begin a series of runs against Yamaguchi's flagship that would last until 10.40 a.m. Thus, Torpedo Squadron 3's attack, although it was initiated well before the American dive bomber attack, did not actually reach its conclusion until slightly after the dive bombers had struck their respective targets. Here you, far from being immune by virtue of geographic distance, was now suddenly in the thick of things. As before, Lieutenant Nagayasu's batteries began blazing away with everything they had, sending streams of tracers zipping out to greet the incoming American aircraft. Only five American aircraft were left to make drops on Hiryu, doing so from between 600 and 800 yards out. Not surprisingly, though, the TBD's drop angles were lousy. One of the fish, as the result of a faulty release mechanism, simply cartwheeled into the ocean, while another broached and ran along the surface like a small speedboat. Hiryu apparently had no problem evading any of them. As they dropped, several of the American torpedo planes flashed by Hiryu's bow, where they were taken under heavy anti-aircraft and combat air patrol fire again. Several were splashed shortly thereafter. In all, zeros and perhaps anti-aircraft fire ultimately accounted for ten of Massey's twelve aircraft. Whether Hiryu's anti-aircraft contributed to the final demise of some of Torpedo Squadron 3's remnants is unknown, however. It contributed to the demise of one zero, at least that of Lieutenant Fujita. Hit by friendly fire while pursuing the Americans into the heart of the formation, his zero had quickly caught fire. From Hiryu's bridge, Lieutenant Nagayasu saw Fujita's plane hit and careen toward the water. Nagayasu was sure that the pilot had been killed. Fujita, however, was extraordinarily lucky. He was already at a very low altitude, 200 metres, but he climbed out of the cockpit and popped his chute, which fortuitously opened just before he hit the water. And then, just as quickly as they had come, the Americans were gone, roaring off toward the east, hugging the waves to escape retribution from both guns and fighters. The combat air patrol fighters, many of whom had been engaged with Torpedo Squadron 3 and who were now chasing the attackers away from the fleet, could only catch peripheral glimpses of the horror unfolding behind them. And under mounting pillars of smoke, the bewildered crews of three great ships turned to face the implacable foe that all sailors dread fire. World War II-era warships were marvellously flammable. Anyone who has been on board a ship of that vintage will have noticed that one of the prevalent odours present is that of petroleum distillates, in the form of lubricants, solvents, gasoline, and thousands of tonnes of fuel oil. Added to this, of course, was ammunition for the ship's guns, which was stored primarily in the magazines, but smaller quantities of which were kept in ready storage lockers near the guns for quick access during an attack. In contrast to today's warships, oil-based paints were used extensively. Wiring ways were filled with insulation that could ignite at high temperature, as could piping insulation, which in Japanese warships was often made of wood. Damage control lockers themselves contained wood beams for shoring, and additional shoring material was usually stowed in the overheads of companionways, 
and anywhere else sufficient space could be found. Warships were, and still are, full of paper reports, forms, charts, manuals and blueprints. Below decks there was cotton bedding for the crew, which numbered between 1,100 and 1,700 men for each of the four carriers, as well as their clothing and personal effects. For the comfort of the men, Japanese berthing spaces often had false wooden flooring over the steel decks, with floor mats and wooden messing tables stored underneath. The galleys contained cooking oil, grains and combustible foodstuffs. Grease deposits could be found in the stoves and ventilator ducts leading from these spaces. The sick bay stored ether and other volatile liquids. The ship's laundry contained uniforms and rags, as well as lint deposits in the dryers and ventilators. All Japanese shipboard furniture was wooden, including chairs, tables, workbenches and so on. Wooden furniture made perfect sense for a country that had to import practically all its iron ore, and hence reserved steel for truly essential items. The net result is that warships of the day burned easily and well. Aircraft carriers compounded these basic problems with specialised ones of their own. For one thing, their flight decks alone represented anywhere from 50 to 125 tonnes of combustible wood. Far and away, the worst fire hazard for carriers, though, was their aircraft fueling system. Carriers typically could refuel aircraft on both the hangar decks and the flight deck. A typical Japanese carrier had a dozen fueling points for both high-octane and normal-octane aviation gasoline on the flight deck, ten more on the upper hangar deck, and eight on the lower hangar deck. A series of vertical fuel mains cross-connected the forward and aft aviation gasoline tanks to horizontal petrol lines, one apiece level for high and normal octane fuels that ran around the circumference of each hangar deck. Vertical risers fed the fueling stations located in the tubs along the edge of the flight deck. Thus, each carrier was crisscrossed by a web of fuel lines, each of which was filled during flight operations with highly flammable liquids. Furthermore, the nature of the cross-connections in the system made it likely that problems in one area of the ship would be carried to unaffected areas via the fuel lines themselves, and potentially all the way to the main avgas storage tanks. The storage tanks were isolated from the ship's other spaces by cofferdam compartments filled with carbon dioxide gas, so as to insulate them from sparks and other hazards. However, the tanks and cofferdams on Japanese carriers were notable for being integrated into the actual structure of the ship. This meant that shock stresses applied to the outside of the hull were directly communicated inward to the avgas tanks, making them particularly vulnerable to cracking and leaking as a result of combat damage. In later years, the Japanese would fill these voids with concrete to try and minimise this hazard, but at the time of Midway, these structural deficiencies were evidently not appreciated. The second major complication with carrier design and operation was that of moving and stowing aircraft ordnance. Unlike a battleship or cruiser, whose ammunition handling arrangements were flash tight and protected behind the heavy armour of the barbette and turret, carriers, particularly Japanese ones, were not provided with anywhere near the same degree of protection. Yet the weapons being trundled about were in some senses more lethal than a battleship shell. General purpose and semi armour piercing bombs contain a much higher relative percentage of explosive than an armour piercing shell most of whose weight is comprised by the heavy metal casing necessary to pierce armour. A general-purpose bomb can be nearly 50% explosive by weight. Against a lightly armoured target, bombs cause much more damage proportionately than a shell. Unfortunately, this is equally true of the interior of one's own carrier. Should such a bomb detonate there, as a result, carriers must take every possible precaution to prevent such events from occurring. Japanese carriers typically stowed their aircraft ordnance in two bomb rooms fore and aft, as well as a torpedo magazine located adjacent to one of the bomb rooms. The location varied from ship to ship. Armour protection over the magazines for most Japanese carriers was minimal. There was always one, and sometimes several hoists leading upward from each bomb room. However, flashlight doors were apparently not fitted over the upper apertures of the hoists, it can be seen that these arrangements would be barely adequate under normal peacetime operating conditions. If a large fire were present on the hangar deck, they might well be disastrous. With such flimsy precautions, it was imperative to follow proper ordnance handling techniques – 
promptly stowing bombs and torpedoes back below when not in use. All the navies of the time recognised the potentially lethal nature of fires and explosions on their carriers and took precautions to prevent them. The primary Japanese method of fighting fires hinged on isolating the conflagration and then actively extinguishing the blaze. All Japanese hangar decks were capable of being subdivided across their width by track-mounted, rolling fireproof screens. These were placed on either side of each of the elevator wells. Larger compartments were also divided in the middle. Thus, several sub-compartments could be created at need to isolate a damaged or burning section of the hangar. If the screens were damaged, however, there were few physical obstacles to prevent fires from sweeping the length of the hangar. Both upper and lower hangar decks were equipped with foam systems, which sprayed a mixture of seawater and soap bubbles onto the deck. The nozzles for these systems were placed at 1.5 and 2 metres above the deck, and were fed by fire mains that girdled the deck, much the same way as the fuel lines. Fire hoses, fed from ring mains powered by pump rooms deep below in the ship's machinery spaces, were also available on the hangar decks and flight decks. However, Unlike American carriers, which could divide their mains into numerous segments, Japanese mains were simply divided port and starboard. This meant that a single hit could knock out half the water supply on the ship. Furthermore, older vessels often used cast iron water pipes, which were much more vulnerable to shattering than steel pipes. As a result, Japanese carriers were much less likely to emerge with firefighting water pressure still available after taking a large bomb hit. On the lower hangar deck, where explosive fuel vapours were most likely to accumulate, an additional carbon dioxide flooding system was deployed. A perforated metal pipe, running the length of the overhead of each lower hangar deck section, could be used to discharge carbon dioxide and extinguish flames. The carbon dioxide tanks for this system were stored at the bottom of the elevator wells. Sufficient tankage was provided to displace 18% of the total volume of the lower hangar space. This system depended on a tight seal of the fireproof partitions. A significant leak in the curtains or the bulkheads would admit enough oxygen to cause the system to fail. Even if successful, it was essentially a one-shot deal. Once the carbon dioxide tanks were discharged, they could not be readily replenished. What the carbon dioxide system did was buy time for the firefighting teams. With the fire temporarily abated, the men could rush into a space and begin applying water to cool the debris, thus potentially bringing the fire to a halt in a large section of the hangar all at once. All of these mechanisms were to some degree hampered by the construction of Japanese hangars. Fundamentally, the two variables that affect hangar deck design are whether it is enclosed or unenclosed, in other words, whether it can be opened readily to the outside air, and whether the flight deck above it is armoured or unarmoured. Each of the three major carrier forces in the Second World War adopted different philosophies on this topic. The Royal Navy enclosed their hangars on all sides with storerooms, ready rooms and other compartments, and placed a heavy armoured deck over the top that composed a significant portion of the ship's longitudinal strength, a strength deck in the parlance. This had the advantage of directly protecting the hangar from bomb hits, but it also carried with it serious penalties. First, the addition of a heavy armoured deck high in the ship's structure made limiting the size of the deck itself crucial, as well as limiting the overall height of the ship. Dual hangar deck arrangements, that is, two hangars stacked one atop the other, were impossible in such designs, because they would have raised the top weight unacceptably and thereby destabilised the ship. The fact that elevator openings also had to penetrate the strength deck meant that these openings had to be kept to a minimum in both number and size. This had a negative effect on aircraft handling and on how quickly the carrier could spot a strike for launch. As a result, Royal Navy carriers carried relatively small air wings. British fleet carriers deployed around 48 aircraft, in comparison to the 60 to 100 that the United States and Japanese navies operated from their big flat tops. The United States Navy had opted for an unarmoured flight deck on its carriers and designed its ships so that the hangar deck was the strength deck. The lighter flight deck structure and lack of compartments surrounding the hangar allowed the hangar itself to be relatively large. Furthermore, the hangar was open on the sides in several locations, 
although it could be closed off from the elements by means of rolling metal screens. While these screens were not completely light-tight, and therefore presented a hazard to a ship in blacked-out steaming conditions or vapour-tight, they could also be rolled up to expose the hangar completely. Thus, American carriers had the advantage of being able to refuel and warm up aircraft on the hangar deck if need be. Dangerous items in the hangar, such as explosive ordnance, could be expeditiously disposed of by simply shoving them out the openings and over the side. These same openings allowed escort ships to contribute directly to firefighting by letting them spray water directly into the hangar deck. It was recognised that the unarmoured flight deck, though relatively easy to repair, exposed the hangar below to bomb damage, and there is no question that the Americans in some cases paid heavily for this design philosophy, particularly against the late war kamikaze threat. The relative merits of armoured versus unarmoured can be argued ad nauseum, but the bottom line is that the Americans were firmly committed to the proposition that an aircraft carrier was a power projection asset, and that power projection was impossible without an adequately sized air group. Given these imperatives, the United States Navy was apparently willing to accept the risks attendant in their designs. And it must be admitted, whatever their failings, that American carriers as a whole were highly successful during the course of the Pacific War. The Japanese chose a design direction that in retrospect clearly afforded the worst of both the United States Navy's and Royal Navy's philosophies. However, this was not readily apparent before the war started. Japanese carrier designers favoured enclosed hangars like the Royal Navy. However, to facilitate the operation of an adequately sized air wing, most Japanese fleet carriers had at least two hangar levels, upper and lower. The hangars were not open to the elements beyond the provision of portholes in some locations and used forced air ventilation systems. For this reason, aircraft were not warmed up in the hangars, although refuelling was performed there. The practical effect of these arrangements in terms of damage control were potentially dire, just like putting a firecracker in a tin pot, any detonation in an enclosed space tends to magnify the explosion. Japanese hangars were prone to the same phenomenon. Japanese warships of this era often suffered from overweight and stability problems. Moreover, with their dual hangar configurations, some Japanese carriers had tall profiles as well. The dual hangar deck design meant that the Japanese had to reduce topside weight by any means possible. An armoured flight deck a la British carrier designs was simply out of the question. Gun tubs were supported by braces and struts that would have looked flimsy to a Western observer, and protruding platforms in some cases carried perforated decks all in an attempt to reduce weight. In some, Japanese carriers were suspect from a structural standpoint and were ill-prepared to absorb damage and continue functioning. This was particularly true of Soryu and Hiryu, which did not benefit from being constructed atop a relatively sturdy capital ship hull, as Akagi and Kaga were. The Japanese suspected some of these weaknesses. In the design of the newer Shokaku-class ships, for instance, the hangars contained bulkheads that were designed to be blown outward to vent the blast over pressures, albeit the design did not perform as advertised. Yet at its root, the Japanese navy was wedded to the primacy of the offence. They believed in power projection no less fervently than the American navy did. But because of their design philosophies, imperial naval vessels were notably less damage-resistant than those of their opponents. Now, after having suffered a shattering attack at the hands of the enemy, these weaknesses were about to be exposed in the most graphic manner imaginable. Kaga was the first, and in many ways the worst hit of the three. At the time of the bombing attack, Lieutenant Kunisada Yoshio, Kaga's assistant damage control officer, had been below decks near the hangar, discussing the anti-aircraft action with some other crewmen. When the bombs came in, the noise was like battleship guns firing. The ship trembled hard. Soon after, the loudspeaker barked that two bombs had hit near the rear and there was a fire. Immediately, the lieutenant ordered all the men near him to grab fire extinguishers and begin to combat the blaze, and sent messengers to roust further men to do the same. The men ran off to the hangar deck to carry out his orders. Kunisada himself left to gather more sailors, rounding up about twenty men in short order. He then started making his way back toward the hangar deck,
The conditions in Karga's hangars immediately after the bombing were horrific beyond description. Bodies and pieces of bodies of Karga's armourers and mechanics lay strewn everywhere among the wreckage of her aircraft. In the open air, a 1,000-pound general-purpose bomb has a 50% chance of killing anyone standing within a 30-foot radius of the blast centre. Inside the confines of the hangar deck, these lethal effects were greatly magnified. Karga lost 269 mechanics on 4 June, most of whom undoubtedly died on the upper hangar deck in the first few minutes of her ordeal. Mechanics, plane handlers and armourers alike were slaughtered by the score blown apart, immolated, crushed under the aircraft they had been servicing, or mown down by shrapnel as they crouched on the bare metal deck, seeking shelter where there was none. In the swelter of the hangar, labouring heavily while pushing planes and ordnance around, many of the men had stripped down to shorts and short-sleeved cotton shirts. These men, even if they lived through the bombing, were likely to have received flash burns. Taken together, the initial hits on Karga probably killed or badly wounded almost every man in the upper hangar. The few men who survived there were undoubtedly shocked into near insensibility. The incredible noise of the explosions had been stunning, even to men standing on the bridge. The noise level in the hangars had been literally deafening. The general cacophony, in combination with the explosions, fire and rapid spread of smoke, meant that many of the men were incapable of action, either to save the ship or themselves. They would have wandered aimlessly, unsure of whether or how to escape the conflagration, many were crawling. Others, perhaps many of the wounded, would have been unable to move far in any case. Even for those still mobile, the difference between life and death would have hinged on the slightest of happenstances. With the fires blazing up in all directions, running into the wrong burning corridor, or finding a hatch or companionway blocked in front of you meant death. Shutting oneself into a smaller compartment, even if it seemed to offer temporary sanctuary from the blaze in the hangars, brought death as well. Having the good fortune to have left the hangar for a quick trip to the head, or to run an errand below decks, might have meant life. Though Lieutenant Kunisada may not have realised it, with at least four hits placed along the length of Karga's upper hangar, any realistic hope of containing the ship's damage had been destroyed. Japanese damage control practice was to isolate the damaged area and fight the fire locally. Now, isolation of a single problem area was no longer possible. Instead, Kaga's hangar had been transformed into a time bomb. The concussions of the initial hits destroyed both her port and starboard fire mains, because three of the bombs hit within feet of the hangar bulkheads along which the mains ran. To make matters worse, the emergency generator for Karga's fire pumps was located, rather incredibly, on the upper hangar deck on the port forward 5-inch gun sponson. This placed the generator some 30 feet away from the impact of the second bomb, almost certainly ensuring its outright destruction by fragments. The first explosions likely killed or wounded many of the men in the damage control stations scattered about the hangar deck, the fireproof roller curtains were probably open to facilitate easier movement of aircraft and ordnance. Even if the curtains were being used, several of them would have been destroyed immediately by the hits near the forward and aft elevators. Her carbon dioxide suppression system could not be employed. Thus, Karga's firefighting capabilities were rendered null and void from the outset. Aft of Kunisada, Warrant Officer Morinaga had discovered this already. Hearing shouts that the hangar was on fire, he left the flight deck and headed below. When he arrived, though, the situation was already totally out of control. None of the fire mains were working, so he and some other men organised a bucket brigade from the ship's latrines, which surely must have been one of the most pathetic images in a day replete with grim irony and empty gestures. Next, he tried throwing in flammables overboard, but that proved futile as well everything was on fire already. Worse yet, Karga's hangar was littered with an incredible array of munitions. Between the arming of the first and second strike waves and the inability to stow the land attack weapons, Kunisada would later estimate that Karga's hangars probably contained 20 torpedoes and 240kg warhead, 28 800kg bombs and 4250kg bombs. This appalling total of nearly 80,000 pounds of explosives lay scattered everywhere, on aircraft, on bomb carts, 
or simply shoved against the hangar bulkheads to get them out of the way. The forward bomb hits both landed within spitting distance of the ordnance lift, which was abreast the midship's aircraft elevator. The area around this lift was piled with 800 kilogram bombs waiting to be sent back below to the magazines. With the hangars fully enclosed, none of these weapons could now be jettisoned. The bombs were heavy enough, but the torpedoes were absolutely impossible to move. They weighed roughly 1,800 pounds apiece and were most likely affixed to an airplane to boot. With the elevators destroyed or inaccessible, there was no possibility of carrying them topside and heaving them overboard. And there was no way to move them out of harm's way on the hangar deck, since there were fires burning literally everywhere. Far worse, though, was the fact that the American attack had caught Carga with her fueling system unsecured. Her fuel mains had almost certainly been ruptured in one or more places by the hits. Even if only the Type 97s and Zeros were fully gassed, there were still almost 10,000 gallons of fuel sloshing about in the aircraft, in addition to what was now pouring from the fuel lines. Freely flowing aviation fuel being dumped from many sources meant that the fuel was being distributed in large slicks all over the hangar deck. Not all of it was on fire yet. But in the presence of high ambient temperatures, aviation gasoline was now vaporising at a prodigious rate, though no one probably knew it. A catastrophic explosion on board Kaga could not be long in coming. Much like Kaga, the situation on board Soryu was beyond redemption in a matter of moments, the American bombs had landed almost perfectly, so as to cause the maximum destruction possible. Soryu's hangars were divided into three fireproof bays, but Yorktown's bombers had neatly deposited a 1,000-pound bomb into each of them, destroying any possibility of localising the blazes. The first hit had demolished the starboard side of the hangar, undoubtedly starting fires in the five-inch ammo ready room for mounts number one and number three. For some reason, the second hit had penetrated very deeply, slicing through the upper hangar to slam into the lower hangar, into the midst of Soryu's Kanbaku squadron. In the process, it had demolished the officers' quarters on the port side of the hangar and blown fragments through the starboard bulkhead protecting the boiler uptakes, destroying them and taking the boilers offline. The third bomb landed almost directly on the number four arrestor wire, detonating in the upper hangar amidst the Type 97 Kanko rearming from the midway strike. This hit destroyed numerous aircraft and engulfed the rear of the hangar in fire. Thus, at the end of the attack, Soryu found herself in a similar but worse state, if such were possible, than Kaga not only a fire from stem to stern, but also having suffered damage to both levels of the hangar. With fires already blazing on the lower hangar deck, and with no real way of fighting them in the boiler uptakes, workshops and electrical trunks located just below the area of the hit, the overheads of boiler rooms numbers 3, 5 and 6 would soon be directly exposed to the blaze. Equally as bad, Soryu's lighter construction meant that the hits did immediate and probably irreparable structural damage. The decimation of Soryu's hangar crews was part and parcel with the terrible physical damage meted out to the ship. The horrific butchery inflicted in Karga's hangars was replicated here in full measure. Being the smallest of the midway carriers, the slaughter was probably even worse. A total of 419 of Soryu's mechanics, maintenance personnel and seamen died this day, and the immolation of the hangar decks in the first minutes undoubtedly accounted for the bulk of these casualties. Indeed, a third of Soryu's crew may well have been dead by the time the last of the American dive bombers completed its attack. None of Soryu's command staff, of course, could know the particulars of the disaster that had befallen their ship. But atop the island, Gunnery Officer Canal could tell that the situation was grave. The ship was already smoking from stem to stern, thick vapours pouring forth from the bomb's wounds and spreading in black sheets across the casualties lying on the flight deck. As he cast his gaze southward, he could see Akagi. She was still moving at a good speed, but she too was afire. There was nothing left for Kanao to do at the air defence post. Everyone there was dead and the director was out of action. Already he could hear heavy internal explosions beginning. Some were sharp and jarring. Others held the muffled thunder that betrayed deep damage to the ship's innards. He had no communication with any area in the ship, but he could imagine the horrible destruction being wrought below.
Intense heat and smoke had already driven him back from the forward end of the air defence station. In any case, he began climbing down the vertical steel ladder to the bridge. Peeking in, he was surprised to find that the command staff was still their Captain Yanagimoto, Executive Officer O'Hara, Hikocho Kusumoto, and the navigator, Lieutenant Commander Asanumi. Several of them were burned, but Yanagimoto was still determined to fight the ship, shamed by abandoning his post while the bridge staff was still alive. Kanao determined to regain the top of the bridge and carry on with his duties. He turned and began mounting the metal ladder once again. Yet, as he did so, another explosion rocked Soryu and knocked Kanao from his perch. Instinctively, he grabbed for a line near to hand, but instead of checking his fall, it merely dropped him, albeit somewhat more softly than if he had fallen down into the ocean below. There he stayed, clinging to the line, which still hung suspended from somewhere above. Below decks in the engine spaces, Lieutenant Naganuma listened to the evil thunder of the explosions just above their heads. Suddenly, a violent crash bulged the deck down toward them, and red fire charged out of the ventilation ducts. Immediately the order was given to shut them, but the explosions had warped the openings to such an extent that the smoke could not be stopped completely. The men began to cluster around those ducts that still brought in fresh air, sucking in each clean breath as if it were ambrosia. Naganuma was suddenly struck by the image of dying carp, desperately gasping for air. The temperature was already beginning to rise alarmingly. On board, Hiryu, Yamaguchi and the staff of Carrier Division 2 greeted the panoply of destruction that had befallen the mobile force with sombre disbelief. The magnitude of the disaster lent an almost surreal quality to the situation. It was impossible for the men to truly comprehend what had just happened. Below decks, the men had to use their imaginations to picture the disaster unfolding, but given the tones of the voices over the loudspeakers or men running down from above with news, it was not hard to realise. In Hiryu's main engine control room, Chief Engineer Aimun Kunizi listened grimly as a voice from the bridge, probably Yamaguchi's or Kaku's, reported that all of the other carriers were hit, and that their teammate Soryu in particular was burning very badly. It was up to Hiryu to carry on the fight, down in Hiryu's ready room, one of her flight leaders, Lieutenant Shigematsu Yasuhiro, burst in amidst the lounging pilots. There he found Lieutenants Tomonaga and Hashimoto relaxing. Hey! he shouted to the assembled. The Akagi's damaged. The Kaga and Soryu are burning. We're the only ship that hasn't been hit. Rushing back topside, they joined the other crewmen on Hiryu's flight deck, gazing mutely on the terrible scene. Near at hand, Soryu was heavily afire. Further aft, the other two carriers were clearly hit as well, with Kaga burning furiously. Yamaguchi tried to make out the situation on Akagi. She was still steaming northward. To the bridge watch, he announced that the flagship was still proceeding at good speed, and her damage appeared to be slight. Appearances were deceptive. In reality, Dick Best's bomb had landed in a position to do terrible damage to Akagi, although she did not brew up as quickly as her two stricken comrades. The hit undoubtedly destroyed the fireproof curtain between the hangar and the midship's elevator well just forward most likely blowing flaming debris downward into the lower hangar deck. The bomb also smashed the 4.7-inch ready ammunition lockers for the portside anti-aircraft guns, which were located adjacent to the impact area. Far worse, of course, was its effect on the torpedo aircraft, just about to be spotted for the upcoming strike. These aircraft, 18 in all, were fully fuelled and armed with torpedoes. The bomb would have landed right on top of the aircraft parked nearest the elevator. It appears that the hit took some time to initiate a large blaze on the hangar deck. Certainly fire was not observed on the flight deck for several minutes afterward. This indicates that Akagi's damage was initially fairly localised. Had her damage control teams been able to react swiftly and appropriately to the situation, the fire might have been brought under control before it transformed itself into a more widespread conflagration. However, several factors conspired against this. The first, of course, was the condition of the hangar decks, which were packed with combat-loaded aircraft. A fire on so much as one of these, unless promptly extinguished, spelled disaster. Yet, getting to the blaze through the wreckage surrounding the hit would have been difficult. The second factor was the condition of the midship's elevator, 
It is possible that when the elevator was dumped into its well, a fire may have caught hold and smouldered underneath it in the machinery pit. With the elevator lying over top, reaching the flames would have posed serious problems to any damage control team. Whatever the situation, within about three minutes, things began to get out of hand, as the first of an interminable series of induced explosions took hold. At 10.29am, Captain Aoki, keenly aware that the ordnance hoists gave direct access to the bomb and torpedo rooms below, gave the order to flood the ship's magazines. The forward storage areas complied at once, but the situation aft was more complex. According to Nagumo's report, the rear magazines could not be immediately flooded because of valve damage. This further supports the supposition that the rear portion of Akagi had suffered extensive shock damage from a near-miss aft. At 10.32am, Akagi attempted to use the carbon dioxide fire suppression system, located on the lower hangar deck, to extinguish the blaze. This indicates that the fire was already well established there within minutes of the initial attack. However, if the carbon dioxide system could be brought into play successfully, the fire would be confined to the upper hangar deck only, which presumably could then be brought under control. In such a fashion, Captain Aoki's men would have been able to establish a firebreak of sorts and given themselves time and room to manoeuvre against the blaze above. It would also protect the ship's engines, and thereby Akagi's pumping capacity, from further damage. But it was not to be. With the fireproof screens around the central elevator well gone, it was impossible to seal off the damaged areas. It is probable, too, that the carbon dioxide flasks had been destroyed by the bomb, because they were typically housed at the bottom of the elevator well. If Akagi's elevator had been dumped into its shaft, they were unlikely to have survived. As a result, Akagi's efforts may have been foredoomed, although the damage control personnel may not have been able to get close enough to the centre elevator to realise that the system was non-functional. Less likely is the possibility that the system worked, at least initially, or at least in some areas of the lower hangar. However, fires extinguished by carbon dioxide-based systems have a nasty tendency of reigniting, unless the inert gas can be constantly replenished, or the area in question can then be consistently doused with enough water to keep smouldering combustibles below their ignition point. Either way, the line of the lower hangar deck apparently could not be held. One can only imagine the gloom that must have pervaded Akagi's crew when this attempt to prevent the fires from creeping lower into the ship was seen to be unsuccessful. In the scant minutes wherein all this had transpired, the air battle continued largely unabated. As was previously related, the remnants of Torpedo Squadron 3 were just now, at 10.35am, beginning their final runs against Hiryu. American dive bombers, their ordnance expended, were trying to exit the scene. The Zeros, not surprisingly, were doing their level best to exact some measure of retribution for the calamity that had just befallen their carriers. Having shed their altitude in the course of their attacks, the Scout Bomber Douglas were on the deck, usually alone or in small groups. Like any attack plane, their only real protection against a Zero was to stick in a tight formation of several aircraft and use the grouped firepower of their machine guns to fend off attacks. By themselves, Dauntless were normally rather vulnerable, however. Now relieved of their bombs, and already short of fuel, they were at least fairly nimble. By racing away on the deck, they were also protected from attacks from below. Nevertheless, enraged by the success of the attack, the Japanese fighters went after them. Several scout bomber Douglas were badly shot up, and were lucky to be able to land on their carriers later in the day. Yet in a group, Scout Bomber Douglas were much more difficult targets than Torpedo Bomber Douglas S. Indeed, the Japanese probably lost almost as many fighters in the immediate aftermath of the attack than they had in the half hour preceding it. At about the same time on board Kaga, the bill for a full morning's worth of sloppy ammunition stowage procedures came due with cataclysmic interest. Within a few minutes after the initial hits, as aviation fuel continued pouring from the mains onto the deck, the combination of heated vapour and live flame triggered a fuel-air explosion. The initial blast was so massive that battleship Haruna's executive officer was certain that no one on Kaga could have survived. An enormous orange-black fireball mushroomed skyward and was rapidly followed by at least six more devastating blasts.
Not surprisingly, the retiring American aviators could not help but notice the explosions as well. Lieutenant Kunisada, with his hastily assembled damage control team, had just been in the process of making his way into Kaga's hangar, when he and his men were blown to the deck by the enormous explosion. Instantly, all light was lost, and they were plunged into darkness. Reaching into his pocket, Kunisada took out a flashlight and shone it around. Suddenly someone grabbed his leg, aiming the light down. He saw a chief machinist who groaned that he was hit. Kunisada was able to make out that the man's leg was broken, and his ankle twisted the wrong way. He leaned down to lift him up and try and help him to a side room away from the hangar, when a second terrible explosion knocked both men to the deck. Kunisada landed hard and knew no more. Crouching on the flight deck near the bridge, Amagai was stunned to watch the blasts literally blow out the hangar sides and hurl flame, equipment and the bodies of crewmen into the water. As the explosions continued, the flames began moving toward the air station. All communications were severed with the rest of the ship, none of the voice tubes were operating. Amagai was momentarily consumed by sorrow for the men caught in the hangars and turned his eyes briefly toward the heavens. Looking away from the fires, he then noticed that Akagi and Soryu were both ablaze as well. Soryu was already dead in the water. Amagai's heart was seared by these images, and he felt unendurable mortification at the disaster that had overtaken the force. It was too much to be borne. With communications out and fires advancing toward him, the bridge was no place to stay, and Amagai scrambled down to the boat deck two levels below. Whether he knew it or not, he was Kaga's senior surviving officer now, and as such, command of the carrier fell to him. Yet his exercise of command was largely directionless and did little to avail Kaga's plight. Beyond the outright damage to the ship and loss of communications, three less apparent factors were working against Amagai's ability to fight the ship. The first was that Amagai apparently did not know that he was in charge of the situation. Even if he had, though, his ability to control the damage control operations would have been hampered by a second failing Japanese over-reliance on its officer corps. The Imperial fleet depended much more heavily on its officers of all ranks to perform complex technical operations than either the United States or Royal British navies. Japanese officers, since they were committed to the force for an extended period of time, were given much more technical training than the enlisted men. Accordingly, Japanese officers in many cases fulfilled the role that in Western navies was accomplished by senior enlisted men. The importance of the officer corps in this respect is reflected by the fact that the Japanese navy had a higher percentage of officers in its ship crews than its Western counterparts did. With Kaga's senior officer corps decapitated by the initial attack, she was in an inherently inferior position with regard to damage control. The third factor was Commander Amagai himself. As an aviator, he had little or no direct experience with fighting fires, coordinating communications, directing work parties, or any of the other myriad imperatives entailed in commanding a ship in extremis. Damage control, at least as far as the Imperial Japanese Navy was concerned, was the preserve of specialists. Whereas by the end of the war, the United States Navy would push damage control training and technique down through the ranks until everyone on board was familiar with the topic. The Japanese had no such conception. Damage control was a supernumerary function, handled strictly by engineering personnel. As a result, the death of her two senior engineering commanders meant that none of the senior officers left on board Kaga really had any idea of how to contain her damage, least of all the man nominally in charge of her. Engineering personnel like Lieutenant Kunisada, who had the most knowledge of the survivors, were so far down the command chain that they too didn't realise that they were the last hope of the ship. None of these things boded well for Kaga's odds of survival, and they help explain why Kaga was fated to suffer the highest casualties of any of the four carriers this day. At 10.40am, though heavily damaged, Akagi was still proceeding north at battle speed 3. Suddenly, an American plane was spotted 20 degrees off the starboard bow. Captain Aoki immediately ordered the helm put hard over to starboard to present the interloper with a more difficult target angle. The anti-aircraft guns opened up as well. Although their fire was less intense than it had been, 
the American plane passed to port without incident. But when Aoki ordered the rudder amidships, nothing happened. Akagi continued in a clockwise circle, her rudder jammed at 30 degrees to starboard. Aoki repeated the order, then immediately ordered engineering to check out the problem, 